It's the year 1513. Scottish King James Stuart crosses the English border with a large army and invades Northumberland to honor the old alliance between Scotland and France. In the absence of the English King Henry, the Earl of Surrey is left in charge to gather troops able to push the invaders back to Scotland. On the 9th of September, both armies met near the village of Brankston. King James had no idea that the impending battle was to become one of the biggest disasters in Scottish history. It's the beginning of the 16th century. The Scottish Kingdom is ruled by James IV, who has proven to be a wise monarch and competent administrator over the years, popular among the people of Scotland. His growing prestige and international ambitions raised Scotland's position in the Western European political arena. Despite the initial conflicts with England, he stabilized mutual relations by signing a treaty of perpetual peace with English King Henry VII and marrying his daughter, Margaret, a year later. James's international progress faced its first obstacles in 1509 when Henry VII died and the crown was passed to his ambitious young son, Henry VIII, who soon got involved in the ongoing continental conflict and joined the Holy League against France. James found himself in a difficult position, being an ally to both England and France. He tried to dissuade Henry from taking action against France, but to no avail. In the meantime, the old alliance between Scotland and France had been renewed, but that didn't change Henry's mind either. In June 1513, King Henry invaded the French coast with a large army forcing James to decide which side to join. Worried Scottish nobility, together with the Queen, urged James not to attack England and rethink his options. But the King, probably influenced by his French allies and the Queen of France, had already made a decision. War preparations began in Scotland. James sent an envoy to Henry in a final attempt to avoid the war. But the English King refused to stop the French invasion once again, making it clear enough, conflict was inevitable. Meanwhile, the French reinforcements arrived, aiding Scotland with arms, money, and experienced officers. The King's call to arms attracted crowds of men, eager to fight for their beloved monarch. Scottish forces assembled at Edinburgh in August and departed south. It was one of the biggest and best equipped armies leaving Scotland to invade English soil counting more than 40,000 men. James comforted his advisers, stating that the majority of the English forces were busy in France and that they probably couldn't field yet another army big enough to match the Scottish one. But young King Henry anticipated the Scottish invasion and delegated veteran Thomas Howard, Earl of Surrey, to command the English resistance upon possible Scottish aggression. Following the medieval code of chivalry, James sent a notice to the English of his intent to invade one month in advance. He crossed the border on the River Tweed near Coldstream on the 22nd of August and captured nearby castles in Northumberland. James probably wanted to perform a limited attack, just enough to compel Henry to give up his actions against France, which possibly explained the slow progress of the Scottish army. At the same time, the English hastily gathered their troops using the manpower of the northern shires, which remained unaffected by Henry's previous enrollment, having used the southern shires to equip the invasion force. With the invaluable help from Queen Catherine, Surrey managed to amass 25,000 soldiers willing to defend their land and headed north despite the provision shortage caused by the hurried army assembly. James had his own problems too, as many of the Scottish soldiers were happy with the amount of loot already collected and were simply deserting the king's forces, leaving him with around 34,000 men. Surrey reached the vicinity of Ford Castle and upon seeing the good Scottish positions, he followed the advice of local outlaw John Heron 
whose family owned the Ford Castle and decided to march north along the River Till. On the 9th of September, they crossed the river at the Twizzle Bridge and headed back south to engage the Scots, cutting off their direct line of retreat. James, of course, could easily see the surprise English movement and proceeded to the Brangston Hill to prevent the enemy from taking the ridge. The battle commenced with an exchange of cannon fire. Scottish artillery pieces, though far superior to the light cannons used by the English, weren't properly positioned on the Brangston Hill and provided ineffectual fire. In contrast, English pieces dealt significant damage to the Scottish line, which, combined with the arrow barrage rained by longbowmen, provoked James's left flank, led by Lord Home, to leave their favorable positions and rush forward, probably disobeying James's order to remain in the line. The impetuous charge struck Surrey's right flank and quickly overwhelmed it, forcing the remaining units to flee. Immediately, English light cavalry rode up in support and engaged the Scottish Highlanders, pushing them back. Encouraged by the initial success of the hot-headed troops on the left flank, King James, together with his retinue, dismounted and left his strategic position, leading the attack from the centre. The Scottish charge inflicted solid initial damage to the English line, but the boggy ground between the opposing troops crippled a significant portion of James's charge potential. It's worth noting that a substantial number of Scots, especially in the front ranks, used long and unwieldy continental pikes, which were brought to Scotland by their French allies months prior to the battle. Used correctly, such pikes were lethal and effective weapons, but the Scottish soldiers had little time to get used to the new arms, and rough swampy terrain decreased the efficacy of the long pikes even further. The majority of English soldiers in the centre used billhooks, a type of pole arm similar to a halberd, but with a hooked blade shape. This weapon proved to be a crucial counter to Scottish pikes, being more suitable for close combat and able to cut the pikes to pieces. As battle raged, Surrey started to gain the advantage in the centre. English cavalrymen on his right managed to push back Lord Holmes' troops, much to James's dismay. Eventually, Surrey's late eastern flank reached the battlefield and immediately rained arrows on the unarmoured Scottish troops on the right, which had just rushed to flank the English centre. Things didn't look well for James as his right flank was decimated and routed by Stanley's troops, who soon began to flank the Scottish centre. James probably didn't even realise how dreadful his situation had become. He fought the battle in medieval style, fighting arm in arm with his best men in the middle of the low-lying swamp, lacking the good view of the battlefield. In comparison, the seasoned and battle-experienced Earl of Surrey held his unit in the back, commanding English troops from elevated terrain. Soon, the death toll on the Scottish side inflated and the English advantage became even more clear. James was killed, along with the elite of Scottish nobility. Remaining troops scattered in an uncoordinated retreat as most of their officers were lying dead. The battle was an unexpected Scottish disaster, with as much as a third of James's soldiers killed by the English, whose losses were much lower, probably around one and a half thousand. What was initially planned as a brief invasion of England in order to honor the old alliance between Scotland and France turned out to be one of the biggest calamities in Scottish history. Not only the king died, many earls, barons, and even bishops lost their lives near Brangston Hill. The whole country plunged into grief. James's heir was just an infant, which resulted in almost 30 years of isolation for Scotland in the European arena, with long-lasting indirect consequences of the battle. <laughs>